Hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this virtual program on the Stanford Prison Experiment 50 Years Later, a conversation with Philip Zimbardo, hosted and organized by the Stanford Historical Society and co-sponsored by the Department of Psychology at Stanford. My name is Leslie Kim, and I am Vice President of the Stanford Historical Society, as well as co-chair of the program committee. Special thanks to those of you who are members of the Historical Society for your continued support of our program, which makes these webinars and our other important historical resources possible. For those of you who are not part of the Historical Society or may not know much about what we do, we are an independent, volunteer-driven organization devoted to the scholarship and sharing of Stanford history. And we rely heavily on membership dues and donations to keep our work going and to provide content such as what you'll be hearing today. Anyone who's interested can join the society, which you can do on our website, historicalsociety.stanford.edu. And now on to our program. We are very fortunate to have Paul Costello and Philip Zimbardo with us today. Our moderator, Paul Costello, is the former chief communications officer for the Stanford School of Medicine, where he oversaw media relations, crisis communications, and publications, including the multi-award-winning magazine, Stanford Medicine. His long and varied career has included serving as White House Assistant Press Secretary, handling communications and public affairs at HBO, and working in international public relations. Some of you may recognize his voice as Paul hosted an award-winning podcast series, One to One, featuring interviews on healthcare and biomedical issues with experts and thought leaders, including such notables as Jimmy Carter, Dick Cheney, Oliver Sacks, Melinda Gates, Renee Fleming, and many others. He retired from his full-time position at Stanford this past January, but remains active in teaching, contributing to the Stanford Medicine Magazine, and hosting a monthly podcast on Stanford's Cancer Supportive Care Program. He also volunteers with the Stanford Historical Society's Oral History Program, for which we at SHS are most grateful. Our featured guest, whom Paul will be interviewing today, is Dr. Philip Zimbardo, Professor Emeritus in Psychology at Stanford and creator of the Stanford Prison, Ex Prison Experiment. Dr. Zimbardo has spent over 50 years teaching psychology. He served as president of the American Psychological Association and designed and narrated the award-winning 26-part PBS series, Discovering Psychology. He has written more than 60 books and has over 600 publications, including professional and popular articles and book chapters to his name. Among his books are The Psychology and Life Textbook, Shyness, The Lucifer Effect, The Time Paradox, the Time Cure, and most recently, Man Interrupted. His current research looks at the psychology of heroism, asking what forces push some people to become perpetrators of evil while others act heroically on behalf of people in need. As founder and president of the nonprofit foundation Heroic Imagination Project, he does trainings globally in schools, institutions, and businesses. Thank you both, Paul and Phil, for taking the time to be with us today and for speaking about this fascinating topic. Thank you, Leslie. <clears throat> and good evening, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight. Phil and I will be in conversation for 50 minutes or so, and after that, we'll be joined by a special guest of his for 10 minutes, followed by 30 minutes of your questions. 50 minutes goes by very fast, so we can't really get into the weeds of the SPB, the Stanford Prison Experiment, and you can do that through films, books, and of course, you can and, and Phil, thanks for joining me. And I've been looking forward to this. Um, if you have time. When you and I spoke a few weeks ago, you told me that the Stanford Prison Experiment started out as an interesting little study and became a global classic. And in August, it will be 50 years since the SPC began. And in that time, there have been feature films, there have been documentaries, some are still in the works. Hundreds of millions of people have visited your website, and even an L.A. punk group was named after this. Right. <laughs> Several thousand people are here today. And so it begs the question, what is it about the SPP that allows us such spectacular attention and what keeps people so enthralled in the experiment after 50 years? Wow. Okay. Um, thank you for that great introduction, Paul. Um, <clears throat> I should begin by saying <clears throat> one of the things that is unique about the Stanford Prison Experiment, 
featured here is that unlike most psychological research, which usually lasts one hour, all, all the research I did before that and after that, uh, the researchers arrange it to last one student hour. So students sign up and they come in, usually it's 50 minutes, three to, uh, three to uh, uh, 3.50, and then they go to class. The Stanford Prison Study went hour after hour, day after day, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and it endured for six, uh, six full days. It was supposed to go for two full weeks, but we ended in six days. But even so, what that means is the audience gets to see uh, in the videos that I, I've created, the gradual change in tr the transformation of ordinary young college students, bright, normal, healthy, into uh, cruel, creatively evil prison guards and despondent, emotionally broken prisoners. So you can only see that, you can only, so what you see is the path of these two uh, groups of people diverging. Now, I should say, of course, at the beginning, we randomly assigned the 24 participants into those two categories. So what that means is that is the independent variable in this experiment. That's what makes it an experiment, not just a, a, a study. Um, but we assign them to those two roles randomly. And in fact, nobody wanted to be a prison guard because it's 1971, the Vietnam War is raging. Students are protesting against the war. I am leading student protests. In many cases, the administration, including Stanford's administration, calls the police onto the campus and they were police student physical confrontations. Um, uh, and so nobody wanted to be a prison guard because prison guards are like police and police are in quote, in those days, pigs. Um, so that it's important to note that because it's not that we we had some kids with a sadistic impulse uh, that was latent and it's going to come out when they're prison guards. The, the point was nobody wanted to play that role, uh, but half of them obviously did play that role. Um, and the study started uh, dramatically because, as you saw in the, the uh, slides at the beginning, what I was able to do was arrange with the Palo Alto Police Department to make mock arrests of all the students who were going to be in the prisoner uh, category. Why would the Palo Alto Police Department get themselves involved in this? Oh. Um, it seems bizarre. Yeah, uh, it was bizarre because uh, I, I convinced th there was a new captain, Captain Zerka, uh, who was just made captain of the Palo Alto Police Department, probably after the student police confrontations. Uh, and I had contacted him to say, you know, uh, I'd like to work with you to uh, build better town gown relations. How about if we have some of your policemen have dinner in the dorms and some of our students ride around in the police car, uh, in your uh, squad cars. And he agreed. And so we did that. So now I had an in with him. And then I said, I'm going to be doing this study uh, starting uh, next Sunday. Uh, I wonder if you would allow uh, one of your uh, squad police cars after it's out of duty on Sunday morning to make mock arrest. And he said, sure. Uh, and, you know, so that was the key that he was just returning a favor to me because I had helped, um, you know, diffuse the tension between Palo Alto Police Department and, and Stanford. Let me ask you a question about most people know the broad brush about the experiment. They've just seen the videos, they've just seen the films, they've just seen you know, some photos. And the photos, quite frankly, to me, I don't know how you relate to it now, but they're quite chilling. The yep. event is for six days. There was excessive brutality from certain guards. The degradation of the prisoners began almost immediately. The script searches, prisoners became emotionally upset, and then it all came to a sudden halt. If this were a puzzle, what parts of that puzzle do you think people, most people are missing? What do they not know that you know of that puzzle? I think part of the puzzle was in fact, the prison at the guards worked eight hour shifts. Um, that uh, this, was, this was at the end of August, 
uh, the guards were mostly uh, college students who had been in summer school at Stanford or Cal. Only two of all the guards were Stanford students. So these were students from all over America who didn't know each other. So part of the process was getting, getting to know each other. Um, and, and again, they thought it was going to be just fun and games. You know, they got to get 15 bucks a day, which was pretty good back in 1971. Um, and then they, they get to the, they get to this, this study. And all we, t- all I told them was you have to maintain law and order and you can't allow prisoners to escape because if they escape, the study is over. But I want to make clear at no point did we tell them how to be a prison guard, that you should be tough, you should be brutal, et cetera. One of the guards um, said that you did. What is he not telling the truth? Say that again. One of the guards said that he was acting, that he was led on, that he was told to be brutal. Is he sort of rewriting the truth? Is he sort of, as you know, he's been very vocal that he was acting? Yeah. So again, it's what's what's interesting in all of this is the the uh, li- the link between acting and reality. So in fact, they're all acting. They're not real prison guards. They put on a uniform. They put on, uh, they had silver reflecting sunglasses. Uh, so to dehumanize them, it's an idea I got from the movie Cool Hand Luke with Paul Newman. So, so throughout, they're acting. But what's happened is when you're acting on a stage, at some point, the play is over. At some point, uh, the, the movie uh, sh- finishes for the day. But it goes on and on. It's another hour, another hour, another hour. Um, and so, so what we saw is the guards becoming their role. The role is arbitrary. But now pretty soon, uh, they become their role only because on the morning of the second day, the prisoners rebelled, as you saw one of the slides. They locked themselves in the cell. with a, They had a, found a, a rope. And then the prisoners made a mistake of yelling and cursing at the guards, uh, cursing at them, saying, but when we get out, we're going to kick your ass. And then the guards said to me, these are dangerous prisoners. So that is the turning point in the study. That's the key, because they're no longer just playing cops and robbers. These are dangerous prisoners who uh, have to be subdued. And at that point, the guards break down the, the prison cell doors, strip the prisoners naked, in some cases, tie them up, put them in a closet, which was solitary confinement. And, at the, and that, that's the moment at which the key turns. And this becomes uh, a prison, and not a prison of the mind, but a, a prison of flesh and blood uh, suffering. As you're watching this unfold, aren't you feeling horror? Aren't you feeling a sense of responsibility? What are you thinking about as the, you're both, you had a role as a researcher and the superintendent of the prison. So when you see all of this unfolding, what are you thinking about what's happening to this human being? Oh, see, that was the mistake I made. I should have only been the prison and uh, principal investigator. Once I accepted the role of superintendent, uh, which I did because all of my staff had a role. There was an undergraduate student, David Jaffe. He played the role of warden. My key graduate student, Craig Haney, who we should talk about later, who went on to do great things uh, uh, to reform prisons. He was a lieutenant along with Kurt Banks, uh, who was the other lieutenant. And they said, you should be the superintendent. But that was a mistake because the superintendent of a prison, the superintendent of a school, of a hospital, is concerned more about the staff than, than the, the, the people who come and go. Prisons come and go, students come and go, patients come and go. So that I did not get upset when I saw the guards uh, brutalizing the prisoners. My only restraint, I kept saying, you cannot use any physical force. You cannot physically punish the students. This was true after the f- first day when they had that confrontation. But what the guards did is they developed ever more creatively uh, sadistic and evil ways to subdue the prisoners. Uh, and it was worse and worse and worse. The other thing that happens is boredom. Uh, boredom is a powerful motivation for evil. You got eight hours to kill, especially on the night shift. Uh, you come in at nine o'clock at night and you gotta, you're got you going to be there throughout the middle of the night. Um, and the, the only thing you have to lighten up your boredom are the prisoners who are your playthings. 
In fact, one of the guards who was later named John Wayne, the, 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 uh, the rough, terrible uh, Hollywood cowboy, you know, he said, um, <clears throat> I, I, I felt like I was a puppeteer and these guys were my puppets and I would make them do things. Now that's the ultimate dehumanization. He, he's an 18 year old freshman at that time from, from a, a Southern California college. And he's making the experiment work by being domineering and dominant. Uh, and, and, but every night coming up with a more and more creative scenario that he would persuade the other two guards to join in with him. You described the SPD as a Greek tragedy. And I'm curious about the words Greek tragedy. Is there regret in that? Is there regret that you ever began the experiment when you look back 50 years? Oh, yeah, I have mixed feelings. Um, uh, we'll talk later on about um, who was the person who brought me to my senses. But again, the other thing is <clears throat> you have to realize <clears throat> that for that for all of that time, I was, I, Phil Zimbardo, was embodied in that experiment. Uh, I used to work 12-hour shifts, you know, uh, observing, uh, this, uh, talking about what, with my staff, taking notes, help, uh, do, doing the video. And then when I would go to sleep, I would go to sleep in my office on the second floor of Jordan Hall on, on a couch in my office. And I would be awakened when there was some problem that I had to deal with. Uh, like prison is having a broke break, breakdown, so so I was in psychologically and physically embedded in that study, uh, and I had broken off relationships with the outside world all all during that time. Isn't there something you you know that there's no debate, and you agree with this that the SPE was unethical? Oh yeah. And you know that your colleagues in the field, and you agree on that, and it could never occur today. Human subject trials went through a great overhaul after it. Institutional review boards were created to protect human subjects. So now, after 50 years, what is left standing from the SPE? What do you think is there? And, and what prism or lens do you want people today to see the experiment through? Yeah, I'd like them to see the experiment through the book I wrote, The Looser Effect, subtitled Understanding How Good People Turn Evil. Um, so that in that book, uh, I have a chapter on each of, each of the highlights that happen each of those six days. And then I have a whole chapter on the ethics of the study. Was it ethical or not? Um, was it ethical or not? It was ethical because the Stanford Human Subjects Research Committee approved it that Stanford Re Human Research Committee had just started then in 1971, and I submitted this proposal. And they, they said, okay, you have to have informed consent. You have to tell the prisoners that there will be stress, minimally adequate diet, um, you know, um, I, but at any point, if, a, if, if anybody, any participant, you're not, you can't call them subjects, any participant can, uh, if, they, if they can't stand it, all they have to do is say, I, I choose to leave this experiment or I choose to leave this study. Uh, and we held them up to that. But, they, they, but then I said, they have to say those words. They can't say, I, wanna, I, want, I, wanna, uh, I want my lawyer, I want my parents, I want a doctor, I want, I want out. Uh, so it's, it's ethical because it was approved by the Stanford Human Subject Research Committee and all the constraints they put on it, we followed through. But they never came down during the study to see the abuses that were going on, in which case they would have blown the whistle. And they, they well, you, saw, you saw the abuses, you were there, you saw the abuses. What were you thinking when you saw the abuses? The, I didn't see abuses. It, it really, the, the important thing is the language. What I saw is guards becoming more and more domineering, more and more dominant. Um, so it's really like the guards in Abu Ghraib prison, uh, which I, I studied later on in great detail, um, that is, um, you start off doing a, a little bit of abuse to the prisoners and that that's the platform on which you build further abuse and then you're getting bored and you want to you have creative creatively uh, creative abuses um, and so I never so the language is critical I never saw abuses I saw the guards becoming ever more dominant 
So the language is really critical. It's, it's, um, it's my Sicilian colleague, uh, Luigi Pirandello, has this wonderful play, Six Characters in Search of an Author. Um, so that he, so the, the guards were characters and they were looking around, how do, we, how do we get meaning in all of this? So they didn't know what we were studying. All they knew is that their job was <clears throat> keep the prisoners from escaping and, and, not, uh, and then to, domin to dominate them, uh, which they did more and more at each day. You know that there's been a lot of criticism of the experiment. What do you think is valid and what do you think, what do you argue with? What do you take, uh, what do you say is not valid in criticism? Yeah, so again, <clears throat> what was really curious is that last June, each day for seven days, there was a, a critical analysis, of, a critic of the study. You know, so in, in the, the blog, the medium, uh, the headline was Stanford prison study is a lie. Another day, Zimbardo is a fraud. So each of these days, it was like orchestrated, literally, a, there had been no real criticism before that. And then this criticism each day. And I went through each criticism and I wrote a clear rebuttal and none of the criticisms hold up. I mean, I, I can make it available to, to your to, to viewers of this. It's, a, it's like a 19 page rebuttal. So for example, one of the prisoners, prisoner 8612, he was the first one to be arrested and he was the first one to have an emotional breakdown had to be released early. Over time, he keeps shifting saying, I was faking it, I was pretending because um, uh, uh, I just wanted to get out. And then I have a video of him 10 years after the experiment when he has become a prison psychologist in the San Francisco County Jail, it, so the study changed his whole life, saying that it was the worst experience of his life because he lost control of himself. He became a psychologist, a clinical psychologist, so he would better understand how he broke down. So, so he tells other people he was faking it, and here he's telling a student who's doing a movie that it was the worst experience of his life. And for me, he's one of the prize uh, um, examples of the, something good that came out of the study. It made him become a prison psychologist. And he says in this little video, which I, I have available, that my job as, as a prison psychologist is to raise the dignity of prisoners <clears throat> while at the same time minimizing the potential for sadists among, among guards. And, and he's been doing that for the past 30 years. So for me, I, I highlight that as one of the pluses that came out of this study. What have you heard from other um, people who were in the study, prisoners or, or guards? Are you still in touch with them? What do you hear from them? Uh, I was in, well, I should say, when we finished this study, we spent a whole day psychologically debriefing them two hours with the prisoners, two hours with the guards, and then we brought them all together, prisoners and guards for two hours. And me and my staff, Craig Haney, Kurt Banks, uh, we went over to discussing what their feelings were, you know, what, 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 you know, really diffusing a lot of the anger that the prisoners had. And, and so the anger of the prisoners and the guilt of the guards. And then we brought them all back two weeks later when we had our videotapes available. Uh, and we followed them up for at least a month or two because we wanted to be sure there was no negative lasting effects of their experience, which there wasn't. Many of them said it was a powerful learning experience that changed their life in, in, for the better. Um, and, uh, and then the study, be, the study became really popular. Now, to be honest, for me, it was a nice, powerful demonstration. And I had done a lot of research before, a lot of research afterwards, uh, and that's all it was going to be. <clears throat> but the day after we did our study, <clears throat> and the day after we terminated our study, there was an escape attempt at, at San Quentin Prison by a prison activist, George Jackson, uh, uh, who is, is very confusing. Somehow somebody smuggled a gun into him, and he went down to solitary confinement, freed all of his buddies who were in solitary confinement, and they, the, his buddies and him killed many of the guards, massacred them. And then George Jackson was murdered, uh, killed by the police at, uh, attempting to escape. And then three weeks later at Attica Prison in New York on the East Coast, 
the prisoners re revo um, revolted, took over the entire prison, made the prison, made the guards their prisoners. And this lasted for one whole month until a uh, governor, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, called in the state police who machine gunned everybody on the yard, got prisoners and guards alike. Uh, so that made prisons suddenly in the limelight. Nobody really cares about what's happening in prisons in, in your state nearby. Nobody cares that they're paying huge taxpayers money to keep millions of people in prison. So what was the link to the SPE from those, from Attica and from, um, from San Quentin? What, what, what was the link? Oh, so the link was me. That is, um, what happened was that after the, after the Attica event, a after the San Quentin event, uh, I was asked to debate with the warden, associate warden uh, Park uh, about, uh, about whether it was the dehumanization of the guards that contributed. Uh, and of course he said it's psychology research, it's all nonsense. So I had actually a public debate uh, on, uh, on television with him. Uh, and then when Attica occurred, I was invited to go to Washington to speak to the Senate Judiciary Committee uh, and here, I, I actually know nothing about prisons at that time. I had no interest in prison. Prison was si simply uh, a location for me to, to study the psychology of um, uh, 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 the psychological uh, uh, processes. Um, but then I, be I became interested in prisons. I, I gave an eight... Uh, 18 page document about uh, how prisons could be uh, uh, improved, how prison, prison guards should be trained better, how prisons could be improved, uh, how prisoners should, their time should be uh, um, um, valued, that they learn new skills. Uh, so I'm saying, so I went from being the, the superintendent of this Hey, prison, you know, to being one of the world's leading experts on prison, never physically having been in a real prison. So, right. so that's a pheno interesting phenomenon to me. What does that tell you about experts? <laughs> uh, don't trust an expert <laughs> unless, as long as they don't ask for money. What was the question that you were trying? What was the question you asked and you were trying to find an answer to with the SPE? What were you hoping to find? You know, the interesting thing also is that you had cameras there. Why did you have cameras? Why did you want to shoot it? Oh, because we had to document, because things are happening, you know, every, after a while, things are happening every minute. So that you couldn't, you couldn't simply be writing down the notes, which we did. We took, we had um, uh, ass uh, assistants copying down minute by minute, you know, more 10 minute segment, what was happening, what were the guards saying, what were the guards, but I wanted to have a record, an accurate record of what was happening hour by hour, day by day. So we made videotapes, oh, probably 13 hours of videotapes. We also, we also made audio tapes uh, uh, with 30 hours, and all of it is deposited in the Stanford Historical Society, I should say, available. Now, in fact, many of the people who criticized the study went to the Stanford Historical Society to, to look at uh, the videos, the audios, and, and the, all the transcripts that I, I, I gave to the society uh, after I finished the study. Since they built a case against you by watching those films, by going to the uh, to the archives, did you regret giving the information and the videotapes and all the materials to the archives? Oh, not no, not at all. I mean, the whole point of research is research should the, the process of the research should be made available to everyone, uh, not only to other psychologists but to potential <sighs> critics. Um, and it's only by having the videos that you could see the process. Otherwise, when you see it, when you read an article about a study, all you see is the description after the fact by the, by the in, in principal investigator say, we did this, we did this, we did this. Um, but it's by seeing the videos that you see the, the suffering. And also, you, because you can see it from day one to day two, day three, you can see the gradual descent into hell of the guards or the whole prison. When did you review the film? Did you do it daily or did you do it afterwards? Were you watching it day to day to day, the film? Oh, no, no. See, I should say in those days, the video was one inch Ampex. 
Mm -hmm. so, so it was that you, you couldn't replay it. I mean, actually, you shot it and then you had to send it to the Ampex Center to get it digitized so that we only had a, a single look at it. So it was while it was happening. Now, you could play, you could play some of it back um, that we did from time to time. <clears throat> but but it was really, I mean, it was for us, the Stanford Prison Study was viewed on a monitor in, behind a screen, not a screen, a wall. We built a wall and the wall had a little hole in it where the camera was. And then all of the staff, we were, saw what was happening on this monitor. So in fact, in a funny way, we are removed. Even though, even though the action is one foot away from us, we're seeing something on a TV screen, which gives it a kind of artificiality. Are there any decisions that you made as a superintendent that you regret as a as a researcher? Oh, sure. I mean, I should have ended the study. What, you know, the, I said the first prisoner broke down was the 8612. The next day, another prisoner had a breakdown. The next day, our only Asian student, he broke out in a full body rash, psychosomatic rash, and had to be released. The point is when certainly by day three, we should, I should have said, you know, we've proved our point. I mean, most studies go for one hour. So we, after three days, that's, you know, 24 hours, that's more than 70 hours of being in this, in this uh, concentration camp uh, a, a setting that I should have ended the study. <clears throat> but why didn't you? Because it was supposed to go for two weeks. So again, here's the setting. Here, it was going to go for one to two weeks. And initially we thought, after we finished the first week, maybe we would get the guards and prisoners to exchange roles uh, for the second week. That's, we thought, uh, obviously they, the guards would never <laughs> have allowed that, but we had, we had thought that. I'm pretty sure <clears throat> that I would have ended the study on Sunday because it, then it would have been one full week because I was physically exhausted and so was Craig and so was Kurt uh, Banks, that it was physically exhausting to be on on all this time. And then when, and now again, we're only highlighting some of the things that happened. There was visiting days, visiting nights, two nights a week. Uh, there was a parole board hearing headed by Carla Prescott, an ex-convict who was in charge of the parole board. Um, uh, there was a visit by a Catholic priest who had been a prison chaplain. So there's a lot of things going on um, uh, all, the, you know, all the time. Um, and that would, but everything is data. We're recording what, what happens when the parents visit, what happens when the, uh, the uh, prison chaplain visits, uh, what happens in, during the parole board hearing. So it's not simply everything happening between prisons and guards. That's, that's the, those are the main actors. But then there's this supplementary cast around parents, um, um, uh, ex-convict, uh, a police chaplain, et cetera. Um, so it was, it was, it was full of vibrancy, if you will. You mentioned Abu Ghraib, and I want to go to that. During the early stages of the Iraq War, U.S. Army and intelligence personnel committed a series of human rights abuses against detainees in the Abu Ghraib prison. And the abuses included physical and sexual assault and murder. Eleven soldiers were charged with a range of crimes. You decided to be an expert witness for one. Army Reserve Staff Sergeant Ivan Chip Frederick. Why did you decide to throw yourself in the middle of this really controversial case? What did you want to do? What did you want to prove? And how did you, why did you want to help him? Oh, so first of all, <clears throat> um, I, I knew very little about that study except what you saw in the newspaper. Uh, a, a, a lawyer for one of the guards called me and said, uh, uh, I would like you to be to be willing to be an expert witness in the trial of Chip Frederick uh, <clears throat> uh, to to bring to bear what was the psychology of that situation that made this guy do what he did. So Chip Frederick was a st staff sergeant in charge of the night shift. Curiously, all the abuses that took place, and there were thousands of them, only took place in the night shift. There was no abuse in the day shift in Abu Ghraib prison. Abu Ghraib prison was a place where pri Iraqi prisoners were put 
because they were going to be interrogated about um, uh, attacks attacks on 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 the uh, the barracks. Um, <clears throat> but the guards, uh, the American prison guards, and there were ten of them or eleven, including several women, which was really strange. Women guards as well as men guards. <clears throat> They did two things. First, they be, I think it was just the, the, the 2004 digital cameras first appeared and they were taking pictures of everything they did. They were proud of what they were doing. They were not embarrassed. And, and again, it was, this, is, this went on for three months. Our study went on for six days. And, and again, night after night, they say, what are we going to do new? What we did before is boring. I can't, you can't keep, be doing the same thing. So, for, for them, it was entertainment. That is, the prisoners were providing their entertainment. They worked 12-hour shifts, not eight-hour shifts as in my study. So you had 12 hours to kill. Um, and the, the Abu Ghraib prison was under bombardment. So when they finished their shift, they didn't go home. They went to sleep in a different part of the prison. So they were always embedded in that social, political uh, nightmare situation. Uh, so, so I agreed. I said, uh, I agreed to to understand this Chip Frederick. So I met with him. I had him come to California. I met with him. I met with his wife. I spent a long time calling colleagues, calling people um, yeah, in his family. And it turns out he's he's a, a great soldier. He won many medals and awards before. He was a great father, great husband. Uh, and, and so he's a classic case. He gets down to this place and these terrible things are happening. And at first he's objecting. And then pretty soon he takes the first step and does a little bad thing. He's you, know, so, you can say that about serial killers too. I mean, many sure. serial killers are, you know, live normal lives. I mean, this is a guy who committed horrendous, horrible crimes. Why did you feel that you wanted to get in the middle of it and defend it? No, because what I wanted to show is that <clears throat> he was a he was a good guy before going down to that basement, and then once he was there, he was overwhelmed by the situation, just as the, our guards were. And, and what I'm saying, whatever happened in the prison study was multiplied by the number of hours, the number of days it went on, the number of months, and so I wanted to be able to testify <clears throat> that. Uh, he was guilty. There's no question about that. But his sentence should be reduced because of the psychological impact that the situation had on him and everybody else down there. And I was able to do that. See, bec when when the news broke about about Abu Ghraib, it was a huge embarrassment to the to the uh, American. Um, um, Military. Government, military, military American po politics. And so they picked this Chip Frederick as the poster child. So he was going to get 15 years in, in uh, hard, uh, hard labor. And, and so I went on trial as, as the person who was simply saying to the judge, Chip Frederick is guilty as charged, but I, I, would, I would like to beg for the leniency of the court because what he did was uh, alien to his nature for the past 30 years. And in fact, he, he, he demonstrates the power of the situation to corrupt good people. But a lot of people are saying that about what happened at the Capitol on January 6th, that they were in a situation that encouraged it, that Donald Trump encouraged them to go up to the Capitol, that they seized the Capitol because of the situation they were in, that, you know, that they were good people, that they, whatever, whatever. You know, we, we hear it now, a lot of defense, a lot of stories. What's different there than your defense at Abu Ghraib? Why would you not defend the same people that, uh, in January 6th at the Capitol if you're using that as a frame of reference? No, I'm not using. Okay, uh, that's it, Paul. It, it's actually a good, um, a, a good transition into January six. <clears throat> January six is really not comparable to what happened in Abu Ghraib. Uh, in Abu Ghraib, people are going to their job, just like in Stanford Prison Study. The, for that for that time, the guards are going into the, into their job, for which they're getting paid. Uh, there's a set of this set of rules that their behavior is under, under observation, under control. What happened on January 6th is that this was an insurrection uh, 
uh, motivated by um, a charismatic leader, uh, Donald Trump, <clears throat> who, who told his people, his followers, and he had many, many devoted followers, that what they had to do was stop the electoral college vote. That, that was very specific. That is, he said that he had this delusion, he still does, that he won the election. And, and he, so he told them to go into the Capitol to stop the vote. And so they had, so, so he is inciting a riot. Now, once you get into that, once, you, once you're among thousands of people or yelling and screaming, then there is a new kind of mob psychology that that they are they are exciting one another. It's it's exciting to be in a in, in one of those these crazy crazy settings, yelling and screaming and cursing and 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 then they're breaking down the walls. They're, they're beating up people. They are killing policemen. Um, uh, they're they're looting. They're stealing things. So, so then it, it all becomes unhinged. That the purpose of that from Trump. He only wanted one thing, stop the Electoral College from approving Biden winner over him. But once they got, once they broke into the Capitol, then, in quote, all hell broke loose. And, and there, was, there was no one in charge. Um, and, and in fact, it was clear that um, uh, they, were, they were set, they could have killed uh, uh, Vice President Pence. They could have killed um, um, other people in the administration um, uh, who got in their way. I'm going to have to move on because there were men up with right now. Okay. Yes, but I want to ask you finally about your legacy. What do you want to be remembered for? What do you want your legacy to be? Obviously, the SPE, the Stanford Prison Experiment, will be the lead story, but what do you hope is filled in the blanks? Oh, no. So what I hope, no, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be remembered for. Uh, he created uh, an evil, evil in the Stanford basement of, of Jordan Hall. Uh, what I've been doing since then is I created um, a nonprofit foundation in San Francisco called the Heroic Imagination Project. Uh, uh, our goal is to train young people to be everyday heroes, heroes in waiting. Uh, I teach. I created lessons like the ones I used to use at Stanford in my social psychology lectures uh, on how to transform passive bystanders into active heroes, uh, how to transform prejudice and discrimination to understanding acceptance of others, how to transform uh, fixed static mindsets into dynamic growth, growth set mindset, uh, borrowed from my colleague, Carol Dweck at Stanford. So we have these lessons that I've created that we, we license to schools. I go and I do training of the teachers. And now they're using these in many um, uh, human relations programs in business. And our program is now around the world. We're in a dozen different countries, uh, many in Europe, uh, in, in uh, Bali, uh, in uh, Tehran, in Portugal, in, in Sicily, in Holland, uh, 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 Ger Russia, no, uh, Germany, Poland, uh, and Hungary. So, so it's, it's a dynamic force now creating good in the world. So it's it, time to cleanse the spirit of the Stanford <laughs> prison experiment. It's, it's a, it's a Zimbardo cleansing. So it helps cleanse me uh, because what I'm doing now is creating goodness in the world. Uh, and it's, we started with creating, a, 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 you know, a generation of use. Uh, but see, it's again, it's, it leads us into the whole question of the psychology of heroism. And curiously, the word hero and heroism does not exist in the psychology lexicon. It's not something psychologists have ever studied. So, so I'm not, a, I'm, so in addition to do, doing the educational part, uh, me and my colleagues are doing research, uh, uh, doing studies, um, um, uh, doing, doing innovative programs um, to, to, now, for, so for example, we want to create eco heroes, young young people who are going to change the, uh, the the climate disaster into something hopefully controllable in the near future. So, so we're now we're now going to bring out a special guest. Do you have a special guest for us? Chris. Yeah. Now so, I'm bringing on. Yeah. So one second.
We'll have a, a special guest okay, on Dr. Christina Matlock, Maslock who is a noted scholar in her own right, and uh, in, not in her own right, she's a noted scholar, social psychologist, and the wife of Phil Zimbardo. And um, the, the, I guess you would say the heroine of the story, yes. I mean, the heroine of the story of the Stanford <laughs> prison experiment. You know, we, you, it, Chris, may I call you Chris? Yes, yeah, sir. It, it seems to me that what, what's interesting and in, in, in about what you saw and to back people up you were going out on a dinner date with phil you were dating him you're a social psychologist i think you were finishing your phd at stanford at the time i had and finished it yeah. you had finished it and you were going out to dinner with him and he said would you like to drop by and observe an experiment in the basement of jordan hall and you said fine and you went down what happened well, it was actually later. It wasn't for dinner. It would be like late in the evening and maybe go out for a cup of coffee, something like that. And uh, so I, I went down to where he said the Stanford prison had been set up, the experiment had been set up. And I was just going to wait until he was ready to go and then we would head out. It was at 10 o'clock. Yeah. yeah, about 10, yeah. something like that. Um, and at first I didn't see much. It was just sort of the waiting room and there were a couple of people sitting around and I chatted with some of the, the guys who were there and- um, Some of the guards. Well, I didn't know that oh, yeah, at right. the time, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, I didn't know who they were. And at that point they weren't in uniform or anything like that. Um, and then Phil came out and said, well, you know, we're just finishing up. They're getting ready to put people to sleep for the night and taking them down the hall to um, the, the restroom, the bathroom for the, the prisoners. And I looked up and I saw these uh, guys in these sort of smocks with paper bags over their heads so they couldn't sort of really see where they were and where they were going um, in a line. Uh, and, and there were some people dressed up like guards who were you know, pushing them along and kind of yelling, come on guys and stuff like that. And I just got sick to my stomach. I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing and, and how it was. And when Phil was saying, isn't that interesting? Look at what's happening over here. And I was going, what is going on? What do you mean, you know, this is interesting. It was just such a uh, kind of a shock. And I, I was just really upset. Um, later they, you know, he took me around so that I could look down into the yard and the sort of the nice young man that uh, one of the nice young men I had been chatting with before was John Wayne, a really kind of aggressive, you know, uh, guard uh, there. And uh, again, it was just like the transformation was, was really kind of shocking. And everybody else who was there, all the other people who were helping to run in this study and, and so forth, nobody said. was concerned. I was the only one that was sort of reacting. And in fact, I was getting teased, you know, a little bit, what's wrong with you, right? You're a psychologist now, you know, come on, this is human behavior and stuff like that. And I was just really, I was just really upset. And so Phil and I left and instead of just a nice cup of coffee and chatting to see how you were and all that kind of thing, we had a huge fight. Um, and I just, I couldn't believe, you know, he couldn't understand why I was reacting. I couldn't understand why he was reacting the way he was. And uh, I said, there's something wrong here. You know, you've got to stop this. And, and he was saying, yeah, but we're doing the research and this sort of interesting behavior and whatever. And finally, at some point, I think I said something like, I don't know you somehow. This is not the person I thought I, I knew going out with. And if this is the real you, I mean, we're done. We're through. It's. Uh, I. I just. I just couldn't right. really take it. And that. That was. The What's interesting is that there were other observers before you. Others came in and, and didn't see what you saw or ignored what you saw. Yeah. Why do you think that was? Why do you think they ignored it and you didn't? Well, it's hard to say because I didn't see how they reacted or the questions they asked. But I. So far as I can tell everybody kind of fit into whatever the role was. So even the parents of the students who were there, 
were kind of, you know, being very polite to the people who were running the prison and just wanting to know, was their son okay? And, you know, so they were fitting into whatever the role was. And even the prisoner who joined late, you know, went in as a prisoner. I didn't have a role. And um, so that was one thing. And the second thing was, I think what was more important for me was there was something wrong going really wrong in the relationship that I had with Phil. I mean, it's like really, you know, it's as though we're on opposite sides of this huge gorge or something like that, you know, and, and not being able to get together. And so what um, I, I think I was just frightened by that and wanting to know what happened and understand this, um, you know, so it wasn't like I was thinking about the study or I was thinking about, you know, should this happen? Da, 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 da. I wasn't thinking like that. I was thinking not like a psychologist or a new PhD in psychology and a researcher. A human being. I was thinking about somebody who I thought was really going to be the one in my life, you know, and something <laughs> was going sideways here. Yeah. And um, I think so exactly you said, stop. These boys are suffering. They're not guards are not prisoners, they're boys, and you're responsible for their suffering. It's a terrible thing you're doing. Do you not see what I see? Right. Good. Yeah, that was, yeah. and it took a while, you know, for us over a very, very long cup of coffee uh, to finally get to a point where we understood why we were having such different reactions and coming together on that. And then Phil said, you're right. I'm going back. We're going to stop it now. And so then, um, stop the next day. yeah, well, stop the next day. And, and then uh, I helped out that day doing interviews um, with everybody and doing debriefing when we brought them all together. And so I was part of that whole ending and then, you know, really doing interviewing and the questions and, you know, what happened and how do we feel and, and all of that kind of thing. So I, I uh, helped out with that. So 50 years later, what do you think back to? What what do you think of SPE? The the amazing thing I think about it is that how many people over the years that I've run into, and whether it's students, you know, when I'm teaching, or whether it's neighbors or other people, you know, at a party, something like that, how many people have said, oh my God, I was in a situation like that when, and then now that describe it. So it's something that resonates to so many people, even if you're not, you know, a male, you know, of a young age or an older age or whatever like that, people talk about what it was like in the military. People talk about when I was in juvenile hall, people talk about having a huge fight with my mother to the point where I realized I had my hands on her throat. I was so angry with her. I could have had, you know, I could have ended up doing something that I didn't want to do. And what they get from that study is just the sense of it could have been me. I mean, there are way, there are times where, you know, I can think back on whether I did or other people were doing things to me. Um, so it, it's sort of this universal um, recognition of sometimes how we can cross a line that we think we would never do. Um, and it, it um, ends up speaking volumes. I mean, I've had people break down and cry describing their own situation and what this brought out in them. And, um, uh, and, and, and so in that sense, the fact that it's 50 years ago uh, sort of is emphasizing that, that power of a social environment or a different situation or you're put in a different role and you begin to handle it differently than you think you might. Uh, and realizing that we're, we're, you know, perhaps more flexible or fragile in some ways uh, yeah. than always saying we're going to do just the right thing. And, you know, we'd never, never, you know, do anything, um, you know, bad, you know, or, or hurt, wow. harmful or hurtful. So I think it's that, that deep human truth, that universality in some way that really gets to people. And that's the message I think that they really take from all of that. Do you regret that Phil did it? Do I regret? No, do you regret that he did the experiment? No, I don't think so. Regret's not the word for you. Yeah. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. I mean, the thing is, you have what people often don't realize now, certainly in, in more recent decades, is that that study was reviewed and approved by the Human uh, Subjects Committee. And okay, you mentioned that earlier. 
which says at some level that nobody anticipated what was going to happen. In a lot of other research, you have to think about, well, okay, if this happens, what will we do? If this happens, how do we handle it, et cetera? And they had a lot of things and protections and, you know, was there all the safety equipment and the fire extinguisher, everything working well. And, you know, they were getting food and they were, you know, being taken care of in that way. And if they had a problem, there was student health services that came. Um, but nobody, nobody, nobody anticipated what was going to happen. And so in some sense, that's, again, part of the power of that is that this was a way of making um, possible that understanding and that the people who could do something to somebody else that we would think of as harmful or unethical aren't just stereotyped as, oh, they're, you know, the Nazis would do that, but not us, you know, or these kind of people or something like that. It was kind of saying, you know, so, we could all be there somehow. Yeah. And how do we pay more attention to the kind of things that perhaps are pushing us beyond where we think we should go? Thank you for joining us. And we're now gonna take some <laughs> questions from the audience and you're welcome to stick around. They may have questions for you. Actually, the, one, the first question is, why did you include only men in the? Oh, uh, <clears throat> because most prisons are all men and there's only some prisons, prisons that are all women. After we did the study, we thought about that. Actually, a number of people said, um, uh, you know, what would happen if we had all women, women guards and women prisoners? And I actually submitted that to Human Subject Committee and they said, sorry, you can, your whole setting is unethical. Uh, and unless you can guarantee that there would be no abuse, uh, you, you, we won't let you do the study. So again, it's interesting now to speculate what, what do you think would happen if you had a prison run by women uh, uh, guards, su prison superintendent, and uh, women uh, prisoners. Um, so there are such prisons, and we don't know much. We don't know much about what happens in a women's prison compared to no. We know about men's prisons when prisoners riot, but there's never been a riot of a women's prison, so that we get to see what what's what's the underbelly of the, that prison. This is another question. You mentioned the idea of being able to withdraw from the study earlier. Why do you believe one participant misunderstood during the study and believed they could not leave? Uh, I'm not quite sure who that was, but one person, one prisoner did misunderstand. Yeah, but I, 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 I mean, but again, each one signed and informed consent now they didn't have that with them. That's with, with their file to say at any time when you when you think uh, you do not want to continue, all you have to do is say, "I, I, I quit this study." The first one to break down, he got hysterical. He's crying and yelling and screaming, and you know he says, "I, I want, I want, I want my lawyer. I want my mother. I want an attorney," um, and so. What we did is, we, me and my staff, Craig Haney and Kurt Bank, said, no, they have to say that sentence because that's what's been approved. I, I, I quit this study. But so, so, so we did not release him until he got, he got really out of control. And then actually Craig Haney, I was sleeping in the middle of the night upstairs in my office and Craig Haney took him to student health uh, and we released him. But we didn't believe it. We thought he was faking. Uh, and in fact, we thought he was going to come back the next, there was a rumor among the prisons that he was going to come back with his friends, break into the prison and, you know, liberate all the prisoners, but that never happened. Um, Here's a question for Chris. Does Chris still question her companionship with Phil? That's a personal <laughs> question and you won't need to answer that, but how did, you, <laughs> how did you get over it? I mean, how did you get over, you know, when I was reading the notes in the book, The Lucifer Effect, it was, the, you had a tremendous volatile fight argument outside. Yeah. How did you move from that argument to saying, okay, I think I really am okay with this guy and I'll marry him? <laughs> how, did you get to that, how did you get to that emotional leap? Um, 
I don't think it happened immediately. I mean, it, it was basically getting to the point in later that evening of finally getting to the point where we were, we were kind of coming together in terms of the same perspective and agreeing that the study was going to stop. Um, so that was the first thing. I mean, I wasn't thinking about long-term relationship. That was the first focus right there. And it was late at night, go to sleep, get up the next day, and everything is changing now. Um, you know, all the guards uh, who are off ship are being called in. Everybody's being told it's over. You know, they're having breakfast, they're taking showers, they're, you know, for the prisoners, all kinds of things. And then we did the debriefing and the interviews and stuff. And so I think that whole process of the entire day, um, I was a part of it. And so it was part of me also becoming involved in seeing what was happening, seeing how different um, participants spoke to each other, this guard, that prisoner, or, you know, talking with all of them. And they were saying, you know, I think you picked the big ones to be the guards, you know, that was deliberate. It wasn't random. It wasn't, you know, et cetera. We had everybody stand up and it turned out there were tall guards and there were tall prisoners. There were short guards, there were short, you know. So it was interesting just to be going through this and seeing how they had come to experience this, what they thought about each other and my asking questions, but also realizing what was happening. Um, what Phil was saying to them, he was talking about how he had changed and realized what he had been doing and how that was. So it was in a sense, that whole day, I think helped bring all of us together. And, and then for Phil and me, it was, you know, getting back and going on. So, um, so yeah, we're not quite 50 years married, but we're getting close. And we got <laughs> ma but we got married at Stanford Chapel. We did at the Stanford church. Yeah. Sandwich Church. Well, I, I guess that you forgave him at some point. <laughs> you know, one of the questions that goes along with that is, uh, and I'll ask you, Phil, um, was Chris the only female observer during the experiment or were there other female observers? Uh, there was only one other, actually, Susie Phillips, who just wrote to me yesterday. <clears throat> she, uh, she was going to be, she was the receptionist. So when the parents came down, um, we had to bring the parents' behavior under under our control as well. So the parents, when they came down to the basement, Susie Phillips was sitting at a desk and took their names and said, please have a seat. Uh, uh, the prisoners are having a second dessert uh, and we'll let you in as soon as they finish. Uh, so, so, so she was the only one. I'm not sure, I don't remember now if she actually looked at the videos while it was happening. But she was the only female uh, engaged in the study. But so there were, but there were also, when you think about it, um, some of the people who came down, the the attorney who came down, the priest who came down, and and so forth. But when the parents came down, there were mothers and uh, girlfriends and girlfriends. There so there were there were people coming in to see, you know, what was going on. Chris, how could you? How you know? Since you observed it and were so violently opposed. What did you think of the mothers who saw this and thought, wait a second, this is nuts. I'm not letting my son participate in this anymore. Why didn't any of the mothers do that? Well, that was the amazing thing. I, I mean, um, I have in the looser effect uh, a, 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 a subsection where a, a mother and a father come to see me and the mother says, I don't quote, I don't want to make trouble, sir. Uh, because I'm in the superintendent's office, but I've never seen my son looking so terrible. And he's only been here three days. This was like Wednesday night. And, and then I said, what seems to be wrong with your son? Does he have, she says, well, he's, he doesn't sleep. They wake him up all hours of the night. And then I'm in the superintendent role now. I said, does your son have insomnia? So I'm putting the blame on the son. She's saying, no, it's a situation. And then she says again, I don't mean to make trouble. At this point, I know she's going to make trouble. <laughs> and I turned to the husband. I said, don't you think your son can handle it? And the father literally stands up and says, of course he can. He's a real man. Uh, he's a captain. Da, da, da. Come on, honey. And he picks her and they walk out. First of all, why didn't she simply say, I'm taking him home? You know, because I, I think they got into that setting. They're in a prison, even a prison experiment. And they don't have the right to take take charge of their own son. She literally wrote me a letter that that 
next day. And that night, her son had a breakdown and we had to release him. But I got a letter she wrote the next day, which I have in the looser effect, saying, I'm really sorry. I didn't, I didn't want to make trouble. And she went on and on and on. But, but again, it was me getting into the superintendent role, becoming a sexist, having the, setting up the husband against the wife, because I knew he was going to stand up for the kid. But in fact, all they had to do is saying, we'll give him $15 a day to come home. And not one parent did. That, that, that is part, that's again, part of the study is not just what happened those six days in that basement. It's how the parents act. And how, how did, uh, again, Carlo Prescott, I said, he had been turned down by the parole board 17 of 18 years. He had just gotten out of prison uh, six months earlier. And we put him in charge of the parole board and he was the most cruel uh, um, um, parole board officer. He had some of the prisoners literally crying, saying, you know, I, I would, it was up to me, I'd put, I'd leave you in here for, 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 for and I put you in solitary confinement forever. You're a disgrace to your race, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the prisoners left and came back and said, I'm sorry, sir, you know. And so he got, so the point is he got into his role He's playing the role of a parole officer when he's, in fact, had been a par uh, lost his parole for se 17 years. And once in that in the role, he becomes a cruel, dominant, domineering uh, authority. You know, this is a question that goes to just what you were speaking about and, 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 and a lot of questions about Chris and her role. And do you think it took Chris to break the experiment because everyone else was responding as an authority figure or as the parents? I mean, that's totally bizarre to me and inexplicable that the parents didn't get involved and grab their kid and say, we're leaving. But where Chris didn't she wasn't an authority figure. She wasn't there as an observer, as an authority figure. She was there as just a partner. Yeah. yeah. Well, but it, it, it's a Go little, ahead. I think it's a little different in the sense that, um, how can I say this? That I had a relationship with Phil. Before that. You know, before. And so that was what was being so immediately challenged and that made it i think easier for me to to get angry and and to argue against what he was doing i mean i've often said in some sense suppose it was somebody else suppose it was you know one of the other stanford professors al bandura, al bandura you know uh doing this study and he calls me up and says hey i need someone to come and do some interviews would you come in and you know do this at the experiment and if i saw that I'm not sure that I would have done the same thing I did with Al Bandura. You know, I would have, there was still more the authority of another professor who I sort of know, but not really well, certainly not, you know, having a dating relationship. Uh, I'm probably more likely would have said, oh, come up with an excuse like, oh my gosh, Al, I'm so sorry. I think I, I forgot. I'm supposed to go over and meet my grandmother, you know, today I promised I would visit and I'm going to have to go home and, you know, I can't, I can't right. do it. I would exit. I'd find a way to get out. But in this case, I wasn't trying to find a way to get out. I was trying to find out what is happening here, you know, and with someone who doesn't seem like he's the person that I thought I knew. And so it was, you know, different kinds of sort of roles mm. or relationships mm. there that really sort of, I think, powered, mm. you know, my my response. Yeah, the, the other interesting thing is how the situation changes your perception of what, what you're seeing. She says to me, they're not prisoners, they're not guards, they are college students. And how could you allow this to happen to college students? You, she said, you have a reputation, you love students, students love you. I mean, again, that was my reputation at Stanford for 40 years I was teaching. Well, I had only, I started in 1968, so I only had four years of that. But, but again, it was my thinking, and now what I'm looking at is prisoners uh, being abused by guards, and the guards are on my staff. So my staff guards are abusing prisoners, and the prisoners must deserve it. Um, and, but it's, but really it wasn't until she said, they're not prisoners, they're not guards. They're playing a role. They are students, college students. And really it was like, knock, knock, wake up, pay attention. Uh, mm -hmm. 
And then, and then I said, I, that's when I said, yes, you're right. But she never said you should stop the study. That, that really is what's important. She said, come to your senses. You have been changed by it's your- It's like she says, stop it. Come to your senses sounds pretty clear to me. Okay, yeah. well, yeah. Here's a question about the psychological impact. Um, do you know if there were any long-term effects on people? Psych did they seek psychological help? You said one of the uh, one of the inmates had a breakdown. W what does that mean? They had a breakdown. Oh yes, yeah. So all of it was. All the effects were really uh, encapsulated in that situation. A breakdown means crying cursing, out of control, um, uh, literally weeping, uh, uh, you know, confused thinking. Um, and, but it was all within that setting. It, it was literally when we took them out of that room, out of that yard, and that before we released the prison, I, I would, we go to another, another part, a, a room outside, and I would talk to them and say, oh, it's okay, you know, it's good. I, I tell me about your feelings. Um, and in fact, for one of the prisoners, um, when I was in, I said, okay, look, the experiment's over, I'm gonna be released, we thank you very much. Uh, you, you, you get paid for the full two weeks, even though it's only a few days. And while I was doing that, the guards had lined up all the prisoners shouting, Four, was it 416? 416 did a bad thing. 416 did a bad thing because of what 416 did. My cell is a mess uh, because this guy, this guy started ripping up the pillowcases and everything. And he, at that moment, he, we could hear that. He said, I have to go back. I have to show them that I'm not a coward. And I said, no, no, the experiment's over. The experiment's on that side. You are, you are going to go home and think about it. When the, when the study's all over, I'll ask you to come back and, you know, share your feelings and, and your thoughts. Uh, Did any of them have any long-term impact? No, if that no, was no, that's a good question. Everybody asked that. We, we, as I said, we followed them up. They all came back two weeks later, a month later. Uh, we had them do, we had the new post-experimental diaries that they sent in, in, that they sent in individually. And all of that's in the Historical Society archives. There was no, no, negative lasting effects in part because it was because they were in a costume they were in a place think of it as a play they're, they're, they sign up to play a role your, your role is a guard your role is a prisoner your role is a superintendent and we put them in a costume and then we put them on a stage the stage is that the, the prison yard the hallway in the basement of, of jordan hall and they play the, they have their roles they play their role but it's an improvisational play so they have to they, we don't give them the lines they develop the lines and now the play is over okay and the key is they take off their uniforms uh, the guards take off the uniform, the prisoners take off the uniform, and they get they walk down from the stage and they leave the pain, the suffering on the stage. So they were really, if you look at, they were really very good actors who at the moment embodied the feelings. They were, what do you call them? Um, New York acting thing. Method? method. They were like method actors. Uh, um, and and so so essentially they left the suffering and also the abuse they did down in that basement. And we, you know, some of them I've really, I, I should say also, <clears throat> later on, uh, the study got very popular and there were many uh, TV programs, 60 Minutes, um, I can't a, a number of them, in which I appeared with several of the prisoners, several of the guards, and they talked openly about, about the effect of the study on them uh, while it was happening and subsequently. It's a question about social media in this day. If this was done now, it would be live streamed. We have <laughs> our shows on television, <laughs> on cable and other and network television. Uh, we have reality TV shows that have become dominant entertainment, instant commentary on Twitter, TikTok videos. In light of this, the person says, this experiment seems sort of quaint. I yeah. mean, it seems sort oh. of quaint. It is quaint. It's 50 years old quaint. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's um, right now things much, much worse are shown, you know, uh, in, in the social media. Um, you see it online while it's happening. 
um, you know, so, so here, here everything is retrospective, even though I, ma I made a video of the study called Quiet Rage, which I distributed really to, to colleges because I wanted them, I wanted this to be available for teachers, psych teachers are teaching it. Um, um, but, but always it was, you're looking at this thing in the lens of retrospection that here's what happened August 15th to August 19th, 20, uh, 1971. So everything is, is looking at this past event. So it's actually become quaint. Even some of the language that the guards use, that I use, that uh, Craig Haney and Kurt Banks use. Um, so it's, 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 it's in a time capsule. It's, well, it's a 50 year old time capsule. Um, and, um, you know, and so I'm, I'm glad that I did the study because it had, it, it, it influenced the, the psychology of understanding the power of roles and the power of social situations to dominate individual personality. That was the goal of the study. And it, it, it dramatically demonstrated that those principles. Another question is, Paul asked what was the purpose of the study, but the question was not answered. Can you go back to that question? What was the purpose? The purpose of the study was to demonstrate the extent to which social situations uh, can impact the behavior of ordinary people when they are in that situation, where the situation is different from anything that they had experienced before. So. At the time we did the study in 1971, psychology was dominated by personality approach. That is the idea is you wanna predict behavior, you give people personality tests and they get scores on different personality traits and then you predict how they would behave in other situations. Those predictions were always very poor and weak and lame. Uh, and so the Stanford Prison Study along with the earlier study by Stanley Milgram who was my high school classmate at James Monroe High School in the Bronx, Milgram study on obedience and, and the, uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment together formed a, a joint powerful uh, demonstration of social situations dominate individual personalities. Again, we gave everybody in our study all the popular personality tests and personality in our study predicted nothing the role you were playing predicted everything. You know, we, if I can add to that, the other thing is that at that time uh, as well, sort of is that people sort of believed that if you saw things like in a prison where people, some people like the guards or you know, in a psychiatric hospital, they were being, you know, and abusive and not treating the patients or the prisoners well, it was because they, the guards are sadistic. There's something about their personality and there's something about people who break the law, you know, or are mentally ill, you know, that, that presumably that's why they're there and that explains their behavior. So the important part about this study as well is that that was removed by taking normal, healthy kids and randomly assigning them. So you're not saying, oh, it's because people who are police or people who are whatever, you know, have a certain kind of personality style in order to do that job. So yeah. that, that was removed. So it was really sort of saying, okay, you know, what's going to happen now when the, essentially you have two groups who are the same, you know, they're not really different from each other in many ways, except for the role and the, and the power differential that they have. Is that going to count? For a lot more or less than what they're bringing in terms of their own, you know, personality. Here's a question from Angelica Rample, who's nine years old. Oh, wow. <laughs> and she's going to ask the brightest question we've had. I'd like to know why most of the participants didn't say, I would like to be, be removed from the study. Um, why did the inmates not say that? That's a great question. I mean, they're suffering, they're crying, they're having a breakdown. Uh, the college students, they know it's the basement of, of the psychology department. They, all they have to say is, I quit. You know, you know I don't want $15 a day. One, one of the compelling things is they signed a contract. You know, I, 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 I will uh, hope... I will get $15 a day uh, for a study that may go two weeks long. I will do my best to, to play the role, uh, the role I'm assigned, 
That's it. So partly they signed a contract to be in this thing. Uh, and so the contract had some binding uh, feeling on them. Um, the other thing is why didn't the prisoners in each cell together say we quit? That is none of them use the social dynamic of prisons in cell number one, get together and we're gonna, we're gonna quit. Um, so that it was really the individuals, what the guards did was break down the individuals, uh, the prisoners into individuals, 8612, 8416, 8927. Uh, and so the, the individuals, individual prisoners never got support from the other, other uh, cellmates. When a prisoner was beginning to break down, there's no evidence because we bugged the cells. We could hear what they were saying. They never got support from the, from their buddies to say, "Come on, we're in this together. H hang on, you know, it's it's going to get better, you know, et, et, et cetera, et cetera." Once a prisoner started crying and breaking down, he, he was abandoned by the others, which is really a, a sad commentary. Uh, on, on the social social relationships in that in, in the, among the prisoners. Here's a question about we're watching in real time today the the trial of Derek Chauvin um, and his um, murder trial against uh, George Floyd, and um, someone's asking what can we extrapolate from the Stanford prison experiment and its implications for modern policing in America? Is there anything that we can take from the prison experiment? and consider as we watch this horrendous trial take place? Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> um, one of the things we should be doing is <clears throat> police cadets should be getting more tra social psychological training. Uh, in that training, they become aware of how easy it is to cross the line. Uh, they, they become aware of things like situational forces. Um, um, and that, that, as far as I know, there's very little psychological training uh, in the police academy. And I think it's, it's much needed. Again, the power of this, make them aware of the power of the situation. They should be shown the Stanford Prison Study. They should be shown a Milgram's Obedience Study. Um, and <clears throat> the Derek Chauvin thing is, is unique because... Um, there's there's a twist there when he he first he first gets Floyd down on the ground and has has him contained. At that moment, there's other guards all around, other police around. He could, he could have said, "Okay, we have you." The guy is begging for. It. It's never clear um, why he continued to press down for nine minutes on his neck. Um, uh, so so that now. That may be an individual thing. I mean, it, it could be a fear of this big guy. It could be prejudice against blacks. We don't know. So he's just an individual case. Um, and that maybe we can't extrapolate from the, 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 these research settings to that. Yeah. Um, you know, you're going to add. Well, I was going to just add one thing there. And what was um, interesting, and this came out on that last day when we were, every, this experiment was over and we spent the whole day talking to each other about what was going on. One of the interesting things was that on, you know, for each guard shift, it turned out there would be one guy who was kind of the worst guard, you know, the kind of the John Wayne of the group. None of the other guards ever, ever, ever stepped in and said, hey, right. knock it off. You know, right. we don't need to do that. I mean, that's going a little too far. Come on, let him just, let him go to sleep. I mean, you know, why do we have to do this or something like that? And what really has struck me around the, the Chauvin Floyd case is that there were, as Bill said, there were other police there. Right there. And me. nobody stopped. Nobody said, hey, that's enough. You know, uh, let's, we, you know, we've got, we can now escort him back into the car or wherever it was going next. Mm -hmm. So there's something about the power of not wanting to step up step out, stop something, you know, challenge somebody in some ways. That's a harder thing to do. It's related to sort of being a hero in yeah. some sense. Yeah. Uh, and, but we were seeing it there, uh, unless you're sort of arguing that everybody thought that was the right thing, but it's like, how could you possibly, when he's saying he can't breathe and so forth, how could you possibly say that? But we saw that even in this 
mock prison study where, um, you know, the quote good guards who didn't do that kind of thing never stopped they bad off. guards from doing it. Yeah. So, so on, on the worst shift, it, it typically was the, the cruel uh, head guard. And typically there would be one guard that would be his sidekick. And, and almost always of the three guards, the third one would be in quote, the good guard. He was good because he didn't do anything bad to the prisoners. But typically what he did was just withdraw. He would be sitting in a corner smoking a cigarette while, while the, the other guards are doing horrific things. So he's A, not challenging them, one, and, and B, um, uh, not, getting, not getting involved, but he's observing. So, I mean, he's observing this cruel thing. Uh, the worst thing that happened in the Stanford prison study was on, on the uh, Thursday night, um, the, um, um, the cruel guard, uh, John Wayne, quote, lines up the prisoners. He says, okay, now we're going we're to play a game. You guys are female camel, camels, bend over. You guys are male camels, get behind them. And now I want you to hump them. And the guards are laughing. It's a play on words. And what happens is the prisoners are following. They are simulating sodomy in five days in an experiment, knowing that that uh, they are all prisoners, they, that they are college students, uh, and they are blindly following th these orders. Uh, that was that was the most horrific thing, and that I didn't see till the next day, till I looked at the videos. Um, it's five thirty. And that's the end of the evening. And I thank you, Chris, and I thank you, Phil, for joining us. And I hope the audience felt it was a interesting discussion. And uh, thank you all for being with us tonight. Can I add one one note? Sure. Do you have time? Yeah. So um, there's, a, there's a new Stanford Prison Experiment musical, original score by Kevin Northrup. It's a whole new way to look at the prison study. And it's, it, he's got music for each, each of the seven days of the six days of the study. Uh, and he's also got, what was, the, what was the popular music being played on, on each of those days on August 15, 1971, or August 16. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna have a link to, to that, uh, which I hope yeah, you'll look at. And again, uh, please visit the heroicimaginationproject.org website. Uh, and the last thing is my colleague, uh, Mel Gannis, uh, she, has a, she has a program called The, the Squid, uh, How to Squid Your Brain. So squid is S, mean stop, uh, stop, look and listen. Q, question authority. U, understand what's going on. I, imagine alternatives. And D, decide to act and act wisely and well. Uh, so, so her work is really important to add to all the things we've said, uh, that the positive, the, the meaningful thing that have come out of the prison study. Thank you. Back to you, Chris. Back to you, <laughs> Leslie. Leslie. Back to Leslie. Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, on behalf of the Stanford Historical Society, Dr. Zimbardo and Dr. Maslach, for taking the time to share insights with us. And thank you, Paul, for your excellent moderation. And thank you to our audience uh, for uh, your wonderful questions. Um, special thanks to our co-sponsor, the Stanford Psychology Department for helping to make today's webinar possible. And again, to our members of the Stanford Historical Society, we sincerely thank you for your continued support of our program. For those of you who are not members, we invite you to be a part of this volunteer-driven organization that endeavors to share Stanford history with our community. Even if you don't feel you have time to join, if you've appreciated this program, we welcome donations of any size so that we can continue to bring Stanford's history to life. Thank you all again for joining us and we wish you a very pleasant rest of your evening. Thank you.